This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. I had numerous requests after the last teaching of getting free of the tentacles of Babylon that I had, I don't know, probably a dozen, maybe two dozen emails saying, please make this into a mini-series, because there will be lots of tangles. And so we're, we're going to begin on that trek. It's going to take us a while, because the enemy constantly is re-examining us and testing us, finding ways of creating new forms of control. Always has been. That's what the priest of the darkness does. But before I begin in that, I'm going to share a dream that I recently had. And I want to stipulate with this, please don't send me your dreams. I'm having a hard enough time with mine. Uh, uh, I get probably several hundred emails a month, people that either wanted me to research something for them to give them an answer or to interpret dreams. And normally on dreams, I just say, well, if you turn it this way and, and, and uh, drank half a bottle of NyQuil, okay? Uh, you know, in my younger years, I used to joke, I don't have dreams because old men dream dreams, young men dream, have visions. And so I'm having visions even if I'm asleep, okay, is, is, was my attitude. And there have been some significant visions that God has given me when I was awake. Uh, typically, whenever God uses, gives me spiritual dreams, I'm researching or preaching. And some of my best sermons, I've actually got up, wrote it down. And I break all the rules of, of dreaming because when those things happen, because you use the creative side of your brain, which cannot read. That's the analytical side. And so if you've ever... Uh, maybe try to read a label of something, you just kind of generally know what it is, but you can't read the label because the wrong side of your brain is asleep. You know, it's the, the analytical side's asleep. But when God gives me spiritual dreams where I'm researching, I have literally picked up a, a volume, found the chapter, found the page, and the right side of the page, the paragraph. The next morning I get up, I pull the book, and it's on that page. And I read it. And then so I was actually doing research, and I've had that when I'm writing books and stuff. But here lately, he has been uh, starting to give me spiritual dreams, and they, uh, the only way you wake up and you know they're significant, and I don't know if, if haunting you is the right word for it, but it, it, it just, you know that you know that it was from God, and it won't leave you. How many of us have had pizza dreams that when you wake up, I've, I've woke up laughing because I had such a stupid dream, but the time I got conscious, I forgot what I was laughing about. Barry will say, you know, you we went, because <laughs> 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 of something crazy in my dreams. However, for the past uh, probably eight months or so, I have had several uh, spiritual dreams in which God was wanting me to show something, sometimes to change my expectation, uh, like with healing, with one that I had. But one I had here recently I want to share with you. And when I had this dream, originally I thought Mary and I were in the Middle East because it was just all sand. As far as you could see, it was all sand, and you would have oasis, and you would have vehicles. And there was this beautiful hotel 
sitting in the middle of it. And so we went into the hotel, and we, we got a room, but it was like you could see through all the walls, and it was just a living room type of thing. And some of them had beautiful marble floors, and some of them had sand floors. And Mary and I, would, we would go, and it's like we could walk right through the wall, and we would say, you guys need to upgrade your room. You, you need to do something. you got to have these marble floors. And the people in the dream says, no, that's just too hard. Uh, uh, we're really comfortable. It kind of reminds us of the beach. You know how people have all these different things. And, and this, this room was easy to get. It's cheap. It's affordable. Uh, we're, we're, we're not going fancy like you. It's too much work to get those kind of floors in our room. And I mean, that they got adamant about it, angry about it. And so... Mary and I are just kind of standing there in disbelief. And all of a sudden, it, it, it was like the earth cracked. It's like there was this crack or this snapping that resounded around the earth. And when I looked outside, anywhere there was anything in the sand, like a truck or a vehicle, it began to swirl like it's almost like a sinkhole. And it began to swirl and it would swallow it up. Well, I'm grabbing onto something thinking, okay, the hotel's getting ready to do that. The hotel was built on a firm foundation, but those individual rooms that had the sand, the sand began to swirl and suck them down. And uh, I remember in the dream that Mary and I had absolute sorrow about it. They, they just wouldn't listen. They just, we, we, we tried to warn them they wouldn't listen. And we woke up. And I think easy believism, now easy believism has been around in the body of Christ for a long, long time. Wesley had to deal with it. It's this Willy Wonka golden ticket. You, you go to church so you think you're okay. When with the Apostle Paul, when he was dealing with the Gentiles coming in, he immediately went to Abram. How I many know Abram was originally a Gentile? Not only a Gentile, he was a pagan. Not only was he a pagan, he made the idols that the pagans worshipped. That was his craft. God calls him out, and the whole story of Abram to Abraham is his personal walk with the Creator and how it transformed him. And Abram gave up a lot. He gave up his family business. Now, if you understand the Middle East at all, that family business may have been an investment of multiple generations to build. And he walks away from all of it. He goes out in a place that he has never seen, never heard of, and God says, trust me, y'all know it when you get there. Kind of like we as believers. You know, I'm still seeking. There's nothing on planet Earth that's going to satisfy me. I am seeking that city whose builder and maker is God. And I look at Paris. I look at Washington, D.C. I look at all these supposed to be grand places on the earth. And I go, oh, ho, hum. Ain't none of you have a zero crime rate. So much so that you can even make your streets out of gold. Okay? So don't bore me. With your stuff, I'm looking for, and I don't care if all the, the seven wonders of the world were in ancient Babylon. The hanging gardens of Nebuchadnezzar. Psh. God can do it and doesn't even have an edifice to hang the garden on. He just puts the garden, it just floats if he wanted to. That's the God that we serve. And we have somehow forgotten that, that there's this walk and this constant transformation. Abram went from a coward. Did you know he was a coward? Abram was a coward. He told Pharaoh his wife was my sister. Women, I do not know how Sarah tolerated that. I know a lot of women that have grabbed him up by the ear and drug him out of, out of Pharaoh's court saying, he's my husband all the way out the front door. He went from that to where later on in his life, 
He didn't just face a pharaoh, a king with his army. But with Sodom and Gomorrah, when that was taken over, it was four kings. And many researchers have identified them as giant armies. Okay, they had giants in their armies, took that. And he rounded himself up a few boys in the household, went down there and got his kinfolk back and all the loot they had gotten out of Sodom and Gomorrah and even set the Sodom and Gomorrah people free. I mean, that's a different man. There's supposed to be this transformational walk, but somehow or another with easy believism, we have reduced it to a Willy Wonka golden ticket and you go and you still think the same stupid way you thought before you started going to church. You still have the same bad attitude. You still have all the same quirks. And you're talking to Mr. Quirky personified, okay? I just try to hide it. Mary says, he's just eccentric. <laughs> Yet God works on those things. Now, I want to read you a parable that Jesus taught in Matthew 7, starting in verse 21. And one of the things I have noticed whenever people teach on, you know, the foundation on the rock, the foundation on the sand, they forget the previous verses, which were all a part of the exact same teaching. In fact, this parable is only found in Matthew and in Luke, and both of them the concept of lawlessness precedes the foundation. So it's significant. Starting in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. But he who does the will. Notice he didn't say he didn't, he didn't look at their denominational membership card, their baptismal record. He didn't look to see how much Jesus junk they had stuck in their pockets before they went up. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. I, they'll, put a, they'll put a cross or Jesus on anything and try to sell it to you at the Christian bookstore. Oh, Mike, they wouldn't do that. I've actually seen one person sent me a picture of an angel board, which was nothing more than a, an, than a, a Ouija board, done up with, and it was being sold at the Christian bookstore because they put a cross and angels on it. Here's how you hear from God. You got the wrong channel, Jack. Okay? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, cast out devils in thy name, and have done many wonders in your name? So they were moving in a supernatural power, even. So that brings in all the Pentecostals and the Charismatics. Okay? Okay? Not just the Baptists who built great edifices in his name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. It's iniquity in some, in some translations, it's lawlessness in another. That word lawlessness is extremely uh, important. And then he says the, one of the most important words in the next sentence, therefore. They follow lawlessness, therefore. Okay? So they're connected here. He didn't stop teaching. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But anyone who hears these sayings of mine and do not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the what? The sand. Kind of connecting to my dream. Okay. And the rains descend and the floods come, came, and the wind blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now let's put this thing back in biblical context. What was Jesus? He was a rabbi. What does that mean? Well, he was this traveling teacher that just taught new stuff nobody ever heard of in their lives. He taught Torah. He was a Torah teacher. 
But his depth of understanding of the Torah was beyond anything any Pharisee, any Sadducee, or any scribe could ever hope to muster. Because, and I'm going to let you in on a secret, he's the one who gave it to Moses. Okay? Moses didn't just say, hmm, I think I'm going to write me a book or two and found out it went up all the way to five books. And that ain't bad. That's all I got is parchment and a, and a quill or whatever it is they used to, to write on back then. You know, surely he didn't do it in tablets. That would have been hard to bring his library, wouldn't it? But on, on, on probably some type of, of uh, parchment or what do they call it back then? Um, Pyrus, yeah. And really, when you understand the dynamic of the first four books, he was nothing more than a glorified secretary. God spoke it, he wrote it. Now, Deuteronomy has the similar anointing, but a little bit different anointing, because he was so afraid that they forgot what was in the first four books, he gave them a Reader's Digest version of it. Here's the highlights for this younger generation, because the older generation didn't get four books, so I'm going to give you cliff notes to the commandments of God. Jesus dictated them to him, and so when he came, it was the true lawgiver. Moses was not the lawgiver, except that he wrote them down and gave them the scrolls, but there was one who gave him the law. You find out when you study Scripture that there's a heavenly Torah, that before the foundation of the earth it had existed, and Jesus was basically reading to him that which was written before the foundation of the world. You say, why is all this so important? Because he used the word, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Now, in some translations, it's iniquity. Where did iniquity originate? In the heart of Lucifer, when he fell, iniquity was discovered in him. And that is a violent reaction to God's law, his throne, and his kingdom. That is the very definition of lawlessness. Now, in the original Greek, anonomia. And for those of you who like to look that up, that is Strong's number Greek 458. And it means the condition of being without law. Uh-oh. Well, I thought Jesus did away with the law, which makes you not having a law, which makes you an antinomian. That Jesus said, I don't know this guy. I don't know him, doesn't act like me, doesn't smell like me, doesn't walk like me. I don't think I've ever spent any time with him. Okay. Because of ignorance of it, because of violating or contempt and violation of law, iniquity and wickedness. That Jesus was a Torah teacher. He, he taught, taught us from the heart how to really live it. Why was Jesus' ministry three and a half years? Why wasn't it four years? Why was it, you know, three and a half is kind of a weird number, don't you think? Three and a half is because the original Torah cycle, as given by Moses, before, the, before Ezra and Nehemiah instituted the synagogue in Babylon, it took them, because they only met three times a year where they would meet in, together, and the Levitical order would read the Torah. It took three and a half years to read through all five books. So Jesus lived the Torah in front of the people for three and a half years, fulfilling that Torah cycle. He showed them. That's why studying the Gospels, if you open your eyes, you can see how the commandments are supposed to be lived, and most of the Hebraic Roots movement ain't doing it. And they're the ones that say that we keep Torah. No, if you're, if you're Torah observant like Jesus, then you're Torah observant. You can't run to the rabbis who built a fence around the Torah called Talmud and learn how to walk Torah. So much so, I've, I've got a friend, Dr. Carl Koch, that has rabbi friends, some of the leading rabbis in Israel are personal friends of his, and they're seeing Scripture being fulfilled today. 
that's telling the Messiah is getting ready to come. You know what it is? They have come to the conclusion they don't know how to live Torah. And there's a prophecy that Gentiles would come speaking the holy language that would teach them. <laughs> and it's starting to happen. Prophecy is being fulfilled in unprecedented ways. God's moving, but the spirit of lawlessness is moving just as much. Now, the Encyclopedia Britannica defines antinomianism as the doctrine according to which Christians are freed by grace from the necessity of obeying the Messianic law or the, the Mosaic law. That theologically, that makes most of the church antinomian by its very doctrines. Ouch. Now, some people will randomly pick things out to try to dismiss the Torah. And the first thing you're doing is you're trying to show how stupid the God was who redeemed you. How many know that's not going to work in the kingdom? Well, he told me that I couldn't, I couldn't wear polyester because you can't mix fabrics. That's not what the Bible says. In the Hebrew, it literally says a woolly flax. And in that day, that was, that was made, uh, linen was made, or woolly linen, and linen was made from flax. It wasn't made from cotton like we do today. And so researchers looked at that and said, you know, I, I kind of wonder, what in the world? Why did Moses tell them that? Okay, now they were getting ready to go into the promised land. You see, before the promised land, manna fell from the sky. You didn't have to lift up a finger to get free from Egypt. God did it all. You get to that Jordan, and what you saw is the work is about ready to begin, right? Well, they have discovered that if you take that ancient linen and you blend it with wool, it creates an electrostatic charge around your body that will cause chronic fatigue syndrome. A scientific fact. Now, God did not, he didn't have to go in and explain, guys, there's something called an electrostatic charge. They were a couple of thousand years before even scientifically discovering what an electromagnetic charge was. Thousands of years. So God, see the Torah, Torah, means the loving instruction of the father to the child. So he did it this way. Don't wear this, okay? You're going to have to go in the land. And I know it may be really popular among the heathen, but did you see how their blessed assurance is constantly dragging the ground and how lethargic they are? Don't do it. And yet we have ministers today look at that and try to mock the God that saved them. Out of his commandments like there was something evil. Now, when you break down the commandments, how many know that this is the awesomeness of God? My Lord, how many rules and regulations and laws do we have in America? Millions. There are, there's probably some laws that if you go to a Mexican restaurant and you have too much flagellant, you probably at least violate four EPA laws. Okay? It, 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 it's, it's that bad. Okay? Torah was not only the instruction of God, it was the establishment of a Levitical order. It was also the civil law for an entire nation. So you have civil law, you have ceremonial law, and you have moral law. Now what blows me away is he did it in 613 commandments. You want to talk about super intelligence. That you could establish not only how to walk with God, but how to be a nation and how to have a priesthood and how they were supposed to do all this stuff. All in five little books with 613 commandments. And when you number the, the muscles and ligaments in your body, lo and behold, there's 613 of them. Because commandments are always something you do. It's not just, I'm believing. 
Yep, yep, yep. Ah, believe it. God says, I'll believe you believe it when I see it. When you start doing it and you get yourself by the ear and say, you're not going to do that because God's word says you can't do that no more. God says, okay, he's a believer. Okay. When we study the Torah, we need to understand, we need to separate civil law and ceremonial law. You know, there are some things, like we were dealing with the Shemitah year. Some people had emailed me about that. And that's really significant if you're living in the land of Israel. Israel is that, that land that God supernaturally gave is to have its Sabbath rest. Where on the other hand, what I look at is this, the Shemitah year is a very prophetic year. We have found that out with the last several Shemitah. Rabbi Khan has done a wonderful job of, of outlining that, and we're getting ready to enter into a Shemitah year. So hold on to your bloomers, okay? But as, as we, same thing with building a sukkah. Did you know that building a sukkah during tabernacles, the word is clear? You have to be a native-born Israelite living in the land. Doesn't mean you can't, this doesn't mean you don't, you don't have, you, you're not required to. And all except for maybe a few exceptions, the civil and ceremonial law really doesn't apply to us. But what does apply to us is the moral law of God. What God has said is His will always be His. What God has said is right will always be right. And what He says is wrong will always be wrong. The cross did not change it. Ever. Ever. Now let me also say this, when you look at the history of the intertestamental period, that's the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, when Antiochus Epiphanes went down, you had, you had several things going on here that he oppressed the people, he tried to make them Greeks, paganize them, or Hellenize them, I think is actually a better term. And if they ate biblically clean or circumcised their children, it was a death sentence. And they did some things that Hitler couldn't even think of, like one by one cooking your children alive because you dared. You dared circumcise your sons. I mean, the atrocities were mind-blowing. And that was still very much in the consciousness of Israel. And so you have Jesus gave his life, resurrected, triumphed over death, hell, and the grave. And then he has this day that Peter's up praying on the rooftop, goes into a trance. God shows him a bunch of unclean food, and he says, rise up and eat. And Peter says, I'm not doing it. I have never done it. And everybody interprets that as we get to go out to Red Lobster today. Scripture interprets Scripture. Soon as he, because in the mindset of a Jew of that time, a Gentile was just as filthy as a pig. That if you came in their house or touched them, especially during Holy Weeks, you had to go through ceremonial washing because walking into their home or dealing with them contaminated you. Just as if you had wallowed in the mire with a pig. That was their ideology at the time. And so as soon as he gets that vision done, there's a Gentile knocking at the door saying, this Gentile wants you to come to his house and to preach the gospel. You have all this going on, and it leads up to the council. The first big council they had. What are we going to do with all these Gentiles? The Shammai Pharisees saying they have to be circumcised. And let me tell you something, that was of not only just of biblicalness, it was of national pride because of what Antiochus Epiphanes did. You mean after those years of horror that our children were slaughtered because we circumcised them, you're going to let this... this God-fearing, uncircumcised Gentile be considered an equal in Israel. 
You want to talk about some hot contestation. I mean, there it, it was a lot of debate. And then they realized that there was a greater circumcision, a circumcision of the heart. But you know what was never brought up? The other half that would have been also a sore point. All of these people at that point in history in the church were God-fearers. Cornelius was a God-fearer. He kept the feasts, he kept the moral law, and he kept biblically kosher. The boy didn't have bacon and ham for breakfast. Didn't eat shrimp. He ate biblically clean. And so the, the eating biblically clean was never an issue at that time. It was salvation through circumcision. And then they give them advanced kosher. It's not just eating cow. It's how you put it down and don't drink its blood. <coughs> you know, we violently put cattle down. There's a device that has a spike like that. You stick it on their forehead and it goes right through their brain. So it's very violent. If you would ever go to a kosher meat processing plant, the butchers there and the rabbi thank that cow for its life and what it's going to give, and they bless it. And this is a little bitty incision right here that it barely feels across an artery going up its neck, and the cow gently falls to sleep. It's shown dignity. And that's what part of what they were sharing, as well as, you know, if you, if you own anything as a Roman citizen, you can basically have sex with anything that you own. Any slave, any of this, it's like they, they had this reared hierarchy type of rules and all this different stuff that was a part of their law system. And, and, they, and the church said, you're not going to be fornicating and committing adultery according to God's standard and think that you can sit down at a, at a fellowship table with a, with a Jew and that's going to be okay. You're going to have to rein it in, big boy, and live the way that Moses said sexually. What's that? Part of moral law. And so moral law is going to, is where we draw that from, is out of the books of Moses. In fact, one of the things I have found theologically, any doctrine that does not begin in the first five books is usually a false doctrine because it snips a little bit here, a little bit there, tuck it, tweak it, stitch it up, turn it sideways and squint, and you can get that doctrine. That's not the way the word works. You find the first place it's mentioned, and it never changes from that definition. It only expands and grows in meaning. Okay? Why is that so important? Because there's somebody called the law, the son of perdition, is coming. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. I forgot once again to look to see what time it was I started. It's okay, I have uh, 206 hours on that SD card. Oh, no. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, and I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible. Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way. For that day will not come except the apostasy comes first unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. And the man of lawlessness, sin is revealed, who is the son of doom, of perdition. That's what perdition means, doom. Now, because lawlessness, iniquity is connected with that, it connects it to antinomianism that has gone on to be with the church. And antinomianism has resonated throughout the church. Nobody, God can't tell me what to eat. He's the creator. He can tell you what to eat, when to eat, and how to eat it. And if you're supposed to stand on one leg and point north, it's all up to him because he's the creator. And one day we're going to have to give an answer to him about how we lived his moral code. Ouch. Okay. But the guy that's coming is known as the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the man who stands against the law of Moses. Oh, man. 
I hear preachers preach that, and I'm thinking, how do you not connect that to the rest of your theology? Jesus said, if you teach men to violate the least of the commandments of God, when you get up there, your, your nickname will be Brother Least. Got in by this much. And yet we have whole denominations. In fact, it seems like the longer the denomination goes, the more spiritual entropy sets in on it, and the more they stand against the commandments of God. So much so that we have, today we have denominations that are social clubs that go with whatever wave is blowing right now in social culture, then all of a sudden they become champions of it, so they have a place to become significant, get people in the doors, and get the offering going to keep it alive. There's a lot of things right now in the body of Christ that needs to die because they stopped their usefulness in the kingdom a long time ago. Do you know that was John Wesley's greatest fear? Do you know why it's called Methodism? He had so much in his spiritual disciplines that he did, so much reading, so much praying, so much preaching, so much sharing the gospel, he had to create a method so that he could get it done in 24 hours a day. That's why they're called Methodists. He had to have a method, otherwise it would have led to madness, I guess, for him. He was probably very OCD and a lot of things that he did. But abandoning the moral aspects of the law of God by the church is a working of both the priesthood of darkness and the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world today. Now, I've already taught on the origins of communism and Marxism has its roots in a false Jewish Messiah named Jacob Freik who hated Moses, who hated any law. He was a pedophile, all these different things. He came up with this. The only way to ascend is you got to descend first. So I'm, if there's any sin imaginable, I'm going to do it because only through then. Now they came up with crazy things of, of that, you know, God in the beginning, he poured all this wisdom into a jar and the jar couldn't hold it and it exploded and it went into all of the natural stuff. So it also embedded itself into sin. And the only way that we can get that, all that, those sparks back together is we got to go and while we're in the middle of that sin and we got to look for that spark. You can't, you're too busy looking for the sin. <laughs> okay. As well as to think that God was not intelligent enough that he created a vessel that could not hold all his light. Maybe Dagon would do that, but not Yahweh Elohim, okay? But communism, Marxism, is extremely antinomianistic. That's why as communism is taking on, all of a sudden the church finds itself in the crosshairs. You know, we, we hear from people and, that are in secular college and they mention the Bible, anything from the Bible or a Christian concept and all of a sudden they get a D on that paper instead of an A. There was one girl, I think it was up here at University of Missouri, going through their licensed marriage and family therapist curriculum. They wouldn't graduate her because she was a Christian and didn't adhere to their perversities they were trying to push in the marriage and family category. So she took them to court and won. And not only did, were they forced to give her her degree, they also were forced to give her all her tuition back. Master's degree, baby. How many know that's big ka -ching? Okay. We need to start standing up for what's right. But the reason they're doing this, this antinomianism is embedded in everything. That's why there's no justice in America. Have you noticed there are two, at least two levels of justice? The elite, when they do something, they sure, they don't get one day in jail. They're, most of the time, we, we have law enforcement actually help them destroy the evidence. We had that with somebody running for president. And no, it wasn't Trump. Okay. Now, the goal, the more that you draw society away from God, you position it to go under a totalitarian government, which is what Nimrod originally started. This whole thing that the main current of the world system is to bring you under a dictatorship that they can hand to the son of perdition when he appears. 
Now, you know, I've, and I've, I've done a lot of research, and they, they actually, generation after generation after generation, commit themselves, their lives, their wealth, everything, to getting to the planet to become the cesspool in which the son of perdition feels at home at. Do you know what would happen if the body of Christ, if we would commit ourselves with that same level of commitment to generation to generation, to rise up at the next generation is going to become more righteous and more holy than we are and move in the power of God more than we did? And the next generation does that and the next generation does that? What we could have done and how we have squandered it. I never heard something like that was possible. But the biblical evidence is there. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. By the time it gets to Jacob and God changes that guy's walk and changes him to Israel, it has to explode into 12 because one can no longer hold it. That's the generational blessing. Mike, what are you saying that? Because Bubba, the snap is coming that I had my dream. It is coming. I don't know when. I do know that when God gave Noah a task, he preached repentance for 120 years. I don't think I'm going to have to preach this for 120 years. But that snap is coming. And when it does, anything that is not built upon the rock of God's Word and a personal, in-depth walk with Jesus of Nazareth, it's going to be like going down the toilet. Somebody flushed the toilet. And they're going to be swallowed up by the septic tank of the New World Order. That's where we are. And so the words of Jesus are echoing, what are you building your life on? Not just this pie-in-the-sky pseudo-system of I believe, but it never is translated into action. If you really believe something, you really do it. That's just all there is to it. You really do it. If you really believe it, you do it. Can I add this? If you're not doing it, you don't really believe it. You're just a hoping. And not the biblical kind of hope either. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope I get in. Hope, I hope heaven recognizes my Willy Wonka golden ticket. You see, when I get there, I want them to see me coming and saying, I can't make out who it is yet, but he's walking like Jesus. His stride is like the master. And the closer I get, you know, I can kind of, I can see the presence of the master. The closer I get, I can smell he's been with the master. That's what's going to get you into heaven. You're going to leave that Willy Wonka golden ticket in the grave. But what you take is the presence of Jesus with you. And so, if that snap is coming, we've got some inventorying that we have to do. And don't fall into this, oh, woe is me. Because if God's warning you, He's releasing an anointing to help you catch up to where you need to be to not get caught in the snap. And guys, we got, we got changing to do. We got changing to do. Oh, and the word is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll get up in your business quicker than anything else will. It'll separate that which is of your spirit and your soul all the way down to the marrow in your bones. Oh, you don't know what that means. Oh, can I tell you? Can I tell you? I want to end with this. You know how we're saying all character is you know, genetic, it's DNA? The Word of God is so powerful that if you have a generational curse that is translated in, as a propensity toward violence or anger or you know, filthy lucre or whatever that's encoded into your DNA, as you meditate and do the Word, the Word of God will go in and do surgery on the marrow that creates the blood, that creates the DNA, and the Holy Ghost can rewrite your DNA as far as your moral character is concerned. 
Oh, Mike, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Study epigenetics. Do you know that there are things that you can do every day that can either turn on or turn off your predisposition to diabetes? What you eat, how you act, how you exercise, all those different things constantly can turn on and off parts of your DNA. So why are you telling me doing the Word of God can't turn something on in you that the devil can't turn off? It's now a part of my makeup. Oh, we got to lift the bar higher. Got to lift the standard higher. We got to envision what Jesus can do with you. That has always been a hard one for me. With you. Uh, I'm, I'm, when you look at me, Jesus has a lot of tenacity. Okay. He took me from stuck on stupid all the time to just stuck on stupid sometimes. I told Randy one time, him and I were talking about something and I had done something stupid. I said, now, I said, I am no stranger to stupidity and it's apt to break out of me like a zit on the front of a teenager's face at any given moment. Okay. But it happens fewer and fewer and fewer times. God's working on us. He, Jesus wants you to overcome. Jesus wants you to have a firm foundation. Jesus wants you to let go of the past so that you can grab onto the future. He wants us to be more victorious than we could ever possibly want it because He died so that we could have that victory that we need. We just got to work with Him. And sometimes wrestle with him. It's in our times of wrestling that we walk away smelling most like the master that we serve. Well, Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, we thank you that it will not return to you void, but accomplish where until you have sent it. And Father, give us the strength to wrestle. Give us the strength to change. Give us your grace so that we can have the endurance that we need to have in the kingdom for what's coming, that we're not swallowed up, but that we're on the solid ground of your kingdom, we ask. In Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual, you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity. Revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the Kingdom of God in the Bible? And who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principalities' wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The Kingdom Priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's Kingdom.
intelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.